what's so interesting is that that sent me to the library and I did all this research and learned about, well, that's why you get autoimmune disease and that's why you have osteopenia and, that, and this is why it got better on the diet. And you're like, well, there's a whole explanation right there in the literature that these plant foods that are considered so healthy for us are actually slowly poisoning us. Cue music. Places, everybody places. We're starting in three, two. Welcome to the Autoimmune Hour, where we look at the rise of autoimmune disorders. I've brought together top experts that range from doctors, specialists, nutritionists, researchers, and even those recovering from autoimmune to bring you the latest, most up-to-date information about autoimmunity and how to live your life uninterrupted. Thank you for joining us here on the Autoimmune Hour with Sharon Saylor. Always seek sound legal, medical, and or professional advice regarding any problems, conditions, and any of the recommendations you see, hear, or read here on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio. Join the Autoimmune Hour's Courage Club. Sign up now at understandingautoimmune.com. Now, back to your host, Sharon Saylor. Welcome, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com. And as always, it's my honor and privilege to be with you here on another brand new episode. And I'm just having one of those days. And so I'm sorry about giggling, guys, but you know, that happens to me sometimes. I'm just going to sip of my tea. Okay. That might help things. Okay. Um, yeah, that helps things. I'll continue to sip through that today. Oh, my goodness. You know, when this guest opportunity came across my desk, I jumped at it. I have known about this topic for a long time and thought it was so under, less understood, not understood, so under acknowledged as being a problem. I know several people that have it, including myself. And so I really jumped on the topic. So let me introduce our guest tonight because she is not only an awesome researcher, um, I've just had the opportunity to meet her and she's quite an amazing person as well. So her name is Sally K. Norton. And, you know, she should have been the picture of health. She exercised regularly. She did yoga and she ate a well-researched diet that was full of wholesome, nutritious foods. She even has an Ivy League degree in nutrition and yet her health was far from fabulous. She suffered from several physical and cognitive impairments, including chronic fatigue, joint pain, kidney problems, and the doctors just couldn't figure out why someone so young, and I'll put in air quotes, healthy, could be so unwell, and I recognized that immediately, and she has a degree, as I mentioned, from Cornell and a master's in public health from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And her new book is coming out in December 27th, and I couldn't wait to share it with you. I want you to go pre-order it. It's called Toxic Superfoods, and we're going to talk about it because superfoods are supposed to be healthy, and what happens when they're not for some of us. So welcome to the show, Sally. Thank you. It's so fun to be here. We're going to have a good time. Hopefully we can jam something useful in in an hour because this is a really exciting topic. (laughs) Absolutely. Now, I love the title Toxic Superfoods, but I wanted to go back just a little bit and say, tell a little bit about your story. Because when I was reading it, you know, you were doing all the right things and sort of like myself, I kept thinking I was eating nutritiously too. And then later found out that's part of your health problem. So tell us a little bit about your story that led up to this life of understanding nutrition. Well, sadly, I was already a nutrition geek in kindergarten and running home and saying, mommy, they said we're supposed to do this or this and a goody two shoes and trying to do the right thing. And I love food. I was a bit of a foodie and it was even assigned to put the TV dinners in the oven when I was like seven years old. (laughs) I was like in the kitchen, in the garden, learned to garden as a nine-year-old and, uh, love to harvest and eat things like beets and beet greens and and these foods that my dad grew up on and greens like that. And my mom grew up on rhubarb. We had rhubarb behind the house and we would play with it as children. So already I'm eating well as a child attempting to, um, and decided as a seventh grader to go into the nutrition field because I had this science teacher tell us, uh, you know, with a film strip, which was these stationary images you got to project on the wall and it it said like oh cabbage and stuff will save you from cancer and hot dogs and that kind of stuff will give you cancer and I'm thinking wow you mean you can 
have a lifestyle, decide how healthy you are and whether you get major diseases or not and how productive, you know, like your health is dependent on what you do. So to me, I thought, well, that's the big lever then. That's what I want to do. I want to help people not be sick. But <laughs> I've started tr- struggling with concentration in high school and issues. And then when I got into college, I started having foot problems and that blew up into a big saga. I actually started having arthritis type pains um, by age 12. It just got worse and worse. And I, I adopted vegetarianism, then I adopted veganism, and I was making home homegrown you know, from scratch, plant-based eating. And it just, I had to drop out of Cornell for four years. I had to have foot surgery. I didn't recover well from that. I developed a lot of like cognitive fatigue and, you know, eventually it was like, oh, I must have like a bunch of autoimmune disorders because I've got all this sort of fibromyalgia and all these things that aren't good. I mean, the list is long and boring. And it's got to the point where, you know, I tried the IVs and did all that and, you know, boosted my adrenals back up and did these things, but I ended up with hard lumps in my thyroid gland. And eventually I had to leave my career as a a grant writer and researcher in public health to have a total hysterectomy. And, and I could no longer really, um, sit physically sit. I had to kneel on my knees because my back pain was so bad. Wow. And my fatigue was just intense. I mean, every moment of the day, very demanding work that I was doing required everything I had to just force myself to stay productive and stay focused. And uh, I didn't recover well from the foot surgery or from, well, from either <laughs> foot surgery didn't work. And the hysterectomy didn't leave me better off. I mean, I stopped bleeding to death. That sort of solves some anemia issues, but I became so disabled after that surgery that I could no longer really even read the mail. Wow. The doctor had to send me, he like, you look fine outside. Your labs look fine. This is the thing about this. You can be really sick and look fine lab results and all, even though, you know, my, what my white blood cell counts have been low for years and I have this lump on my thyroid and I've got you know, kind of stressed looking kidneys slightly, but this is not stuff that doctors really go, oh, that means something to me. It doesn't mean anything to them. So they, he sent me to the sleep doctor. And so you go to the sleep lab and they hook up all these wires all over your like pants, feet, legs, head, ch- you know, and you're supposed to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, the result was interesting because it showed that my brain was waking up 29 times every single hour all night long. Wow. No wonder you were fatigued. It would be like absolutely no sleep night after night after night. For a long time. And it took me three years from that time to figure out what was doing that to my brain. Let's fast forward because the surprise to you was it was your nutritious eating. (laughs) All against all odds. And I've been there with you too, where I found out, yes, grabbing a salad at an airport when I was a road warrior wasn't exactly healthy, but I wasn't eating poorly either. And I think that's the biggest aha moment for a lot of us, but also one of our biggest frustrations, because then what do we eat? So let's talk about your specific diagnosis, because it is different for everybody. The diagnosis of what what essentially is happening is there's a natural chemical in the plants that's toxic. And over the years of eating it constantly, it's, it's silently building up into multiple problems. The official term for it is called secondary oxalosis or hyperoxaluria, meaning lots of oxalate in your urine. So, but those tests aren't done for like normal healthcare those diagnoses and those, the tests that determine that is only done under certain circumstances. So the the diagnosis is, uh, okay, it's it's really hard to talk about diagnosis with this because it isn't done. And so the doctor asked me, so what is the diagnosis? I'm like, it's hyperoxaluria and he put it in the chart. (laughs) And that's, that's a whole can of worms. I'm not sure that is all that useful. I mean, what what's so interesting is that that sent me to the library and I did all this research and learned about, well, that's why you get autoimmune disease and that's why you have osteopenia and, that, and this is why it got better on the diet. And you know, like, 
Well, there's a whole explanation right there in the literature that these plant foods that are considered so healthy for us are actually slowly poisoning us and we're not paying attention to that. So that brings us to I mean, so many questions, like you start to freak out. Okay, so what do I eat? But let's back up and say, so the toxic substance is called oxalate. And oftentimes the first wake up call would be somebody having something besides pain and things that could be related to so many things is kidney stones or something similar to that. So I'm curious with around my friends and things. I mean, kidney stones aren't uncommon. Why is there so little talking about oxalates in our food and what if they build up too much, how they can harm our, our body? Well, that is another another hour show to talk about the whole culture of what healthy foods are. I think my next book will be about how do we get to these ideas that certain foods are healthy. It turns out that in the 1930s, there was a fairly convincing lot of research showing that when you give either rats or human infants high oxalate foods like spinach, they don't grow properly, they have weak bones, they have all these problems. And it was clearly causing calcium deficiency. That's one of the main toxic actions of oxalic acid, which is the parent compound of what we call oxalates, is that oxalic acid binds to calcium and other minerals like magnesium, iron, and so on. And this calcium stealing and cheating means the spinach itself doesn't really have nutritive calcium because it's all bound up with oxalic acid as calcium oxalate. In fact, we, we've known for a long time that 90% of calcium in plants is principally tied up is this toxic form called calcium oxalate. So you feed the spinach to the rats or the children and they're not getting enough calcium. But the other problem is the oxalic acid, the free oxalic acid starts binding minerals in the body. So that's what tends to be transferring from your food into your bloodstream the most is the oxalic acid, which is a free charged ion. And it grabs minerals and causes mineral deficiencies and electrolyte disturbances and much more. It causes direct damage to cells, um, which we can talk about because that's really key to understanding immune system problems. This toxicity was really clear that you shouldn't be giving uh, children spinach. It was, the research was pretty much done by the end of, by the mid 1930s, we knew this. But the Council on Nutrition, which was an outfit from the, the AMA, the American Medical Association, proclaimed in an article that, you know, even though spinach is a bad green and the other greens are okay, like collards and cabbage are okay, we won't bother to call it out because it might have some other nutrients or some vitamin A or something. And so just let's just not mention it. <laughs> and that attitude has continued forward to this day. Even my own colleagues at the university that I went to school with and worked with and so on, who are faculty, really aren't interested in having a conversation about what the research shows of about oxalates toxicity, even on like what it's doing to the immune system. Uh, current research, I mean, the 30s sounds like a long time ago, but in fact, oxalate research has been going on really since the 1700s when we started using it, extracting it from plants to use it in industry because this its reactivity makes it a great cleaner. So we've been using it as a cleaning chemical that removes rust and stains and all kinds of substances as a industrial chemical, but we already had a diagnosis of this dietary oxalate poisoning by 1842. Wow. And we're still, I mean, I'm thinking I grew up and really thought that spinach was healthy for me. And we're not here bashing just spinach. What are some of the other foods that are high in this holocytic oxalate? <laughs> Did I say that right? Yeah, so oxalic acid and oxalic acid and the crystals, the plants make both the acid and then makes the plant, the acid to form these crystals. So you eat both calcium oxalate crystals and oxalic acid. The oxalates include the acids and the various crystals and the various salts. So certain plants are really great at making it. Certain plants don't seem to need it so much as much, but the ones who need it really need it. They've been trying to breed spinach, for example, for, I don't know, 50, 60 years to get it to not make so much oxalate. And they can't do it because the spinach can't survive without it. Spinach, and there's only two other major greens that are a problem besides spinach. It's chard and beet greens. And that's it, sorrel. Like, so chard and beet greens are the same thing, basically. 
it's called uh, silver beet chard is like beet without a beet. So that's really the same food, chard, beet greens, spinach. Those are the greens. The other greens are okay in terms of oxalate content. And then there's potatoes and sweet potatoes, you know, like fries, tater tots, chips, they're everywhere. And sweet potatoes are now really popular and then taro and the colored chips, those kind of chip products, they're full of these high oxalate foods. Then there's buckwheat, which is related to rhubarb, which is a famously high oxalate food that has been known to cause major problems. Another famous one in the medical literature, star fruit. You can drop dead from too much star fruit juice or star fruit. Beets themselves, as well as the greens. Chocolate, unfortunately, <laughs> but you don't have to start there. <laughs> let's see, beans, black beans, your standard white beans. It makes like your good old American Boston baked beans that those are really high in oxalate as a soy. Um, bran is really high. So like whole, whole grains are pretty high in oxalate because of the bran and so on. Now I'm going through this list in my mind and I don't know about everyone, but a large portion of my audience has chimed in on this topic of what do I eat? Because mm -hmm. they've been told no dairy, no, no nightshades, no gluten, no this, no that. And pretty soon it's like, no lectins. <laughs> I'm just going through this list in my mind of like, okay, I'm down to two foods. <laughs> so if we're avoiding all of these foods, uh, it becomes sort of crazy making. I mean, I understand what you're saying, because I'm on board with, I've known about oxalates for quite a while, almost 20 years now, and I do my best to avoid them. However, when you're told all these other things not to eat, and now we're saying, okay, now let's throw on this thing we call oxalates, it comes down to sort of a, if we're not having a degree in nutrition, we don't know what to do. We're just at least I'm sort of frozen, like, okay, now what? Well, you know, we, we get stuck in a modern haze of all this conflicting information. And there is a way to kind of boil it down and step back a little bit and just look at it from a longer perspective. And, you know, one of them is we've gotten ourselves into big trouble by being fairly permissive about commercial and industrial foods. You know, the, everything in a box and can in the middle of the grocery store has been highly processed. And we think the answer has been, well, to that, so here's, here's the thing. We've been told since the early 80s that meat and animal fats are going to drop you dead. That's what I learned at Cornell. All cancer and heart disease and everything else, it's all the fat of, it's all saturated fats fault. And truthfully, they were not right about that. So already we were saturated in a culture that's very permissive with garbage and very afraid of meat and eggs and animal foods. So the big worry has been, well, okay, quit eating all that sugar and junk food because you're going to get diabetes. Because <laughs> we basically, by fearing, making people afraid of fat and butter, we've said, oh, eat all this, you know, the thing that came out was a snap day. Like, oh, look, commercial companies can give you these fat-free foods and you'll be fine. So fat-free and cholesterol-free was the big thing. And that helped to blow us up into this giant diabetes and obesity crises that we're in, which, you know, is a type of autoimmune condition. So, all right, now what do we do? We, we think we can't eat meat, which doesn't actually make any sense, given that human beings have been hunting woolly mammoth and giant sloth and bison and reindeer for a long time and, and living on that, including in, in environments where that's the bulk of the diet, like in Alaska and Africa, where it, it's really hunting and fishing that kept human beings together. And all of a sudden around 1900, we're telling everybody that we should, that meat is bad. And the sad part is that that came from initially from the, what's the word, philosophical revolution of man's rights, like that led to the American revolution. Like, wait a minute, we shouldn't have subjugation. This, is this idea that we should be more even. And some of that evenness is like, well, maybe we shouldn't eat animals or keep animals and be over them either. Like if we shouldn't have kings over us, should we be kings over the animals? Like there was a lot of that that went with that philosophy that led to sort of democratic style governance or the, the, the wish for that kind of fairness. But the other thing that was happening is we had a huge problem with alcoholism and and I was really concerned about the immorality of alcoholism and wife abuse and even slavery and all these kind of evils in society. And the feeling from the ministers, especially from the Seventh-day Adventists, but many 
ministers even came from England to America to tell people, look, you shouldn't drink. You shouldn't do things that make you want to lust after your neighbor. You should stop eating meat because that's the carnal. That's going to make you want sex and be bad and drink too much. So somehow eat meat eating got caught up in that. So we are saturated for hundreds of years now in this culture that's been worrying that meat is somehow immoral. In the, in the start of the nutrition, there's a whole story there about that too. Like, oh, well, poor people should be frugal and they shouldn't eat steak. So let's teach them how to make succotash and other foods. So there's a big cultural thing, like we can't even think now in a modern haze. We're, we've got a lot of ideas in there that are limiting our ability to think straight. Um, and then we got this health food movement that came up with that sort of plant centric of plants are more benign and more holy. And so there's this sort of, it used to be the health food store, hippy dippy crowd that was eating chia seeds and stuff. And now that's been mainstream. So you either eat garbage, nobody should be eating meat apparently in our heads, or you're doing this hippy dippy foods. And then the answer in the middle is the vegetables. They're going to save us. Let's eat. <laughs> and uh, nobody stopped to like consult the literature or the plants themselves, whether really they, are we really designing our physiology for your well-being humans is that really our purpose in life and it isn't they're trying to defend themselves from herbivores, from you know bugs and funguses and other creatures that want to take them down and you know if they weren't toxic they would be extinct they have to defend themselves <laughs> so the way to step back from all that is well what did humans how did we get here how did humans go from wherever our humble beginnings were with a club and a cave to where we are now. It was the club and the fire and the, the bow and arrow and the, the spear, like hunting and eating meat and eating a simple diet that didn't necessarily have to be complex. It didn't need food groups and all those things it worked. And so I always use this ancestral lens. Does the information I'm getting make sense from a biology ecosystem and ancestral lens? And that helps us to take it a little thought exercise, a little exhale and go, okay, probably is something to eat. It's just not culturally normal. And that's the rub. People want to look normal. They don't want to change and be different. Our identity is so attached to just fitting in and fitting in right now. There's sort of insanity in the food and nutrition thinking that we've got. And I want to point out though, in reading your blogs and things like that, we're not against eating all plant-based foods, I was noticing that you have some replacement comments about certain foods like taking out spinach and putting in something like romaine. And so it's not just about going back to carnivore uh, completely. It's about understanding what's in the different foods and choosing the ones with the least amount of those different things that they have gotten for their survival over the millennia as well. Is that right? <laughs> Am I following this? Well, curating your diet is definitely the message. And the reason I, I frame it the way I did is because people are unnecessarily afraid of butter, eggs, and meat. And, and if you're trying to limit those and you're filling up, like when you go gluten-free, your choices are many high oxalate foods. Almonds are ridiculously toxic, especially with oxalate. And People go gluten-free and they start saying, well, I can use almond flour to be gluten-free or buckwheat flour or sober noodles, or like you can get into trouble with oxalates because no one's mentioning the oxalates. So if you, you know, if you don't have the time to worry about which vegetables, which I'm doing for you, I have a really simple beginner's guide. Here's the high oxalate foods that we know of, and here's the low oxalate foods that we know of. And you can just start making gradually. You don't need to abruptly turn your life inside out and dump the table over, just think, well, could you live without spinach? Could you have romaine or any other lettuce? There is some arugula. There's, there are other things to eat. And it is really a simple process. It's more like the emotionality of it. You know, I had a whole garden out here with sweet potatoes and figs in it. Like, I, I like put so much energy into gardening. It's like the hit in the gut is more emotional than anything. The, the simple practice of buying romaine instead of spinach, is not difficult. This is really the easiest thing going is that we have this big emotional and mental and social hurdle and just like oh I'm done I'm done hearing about one more thing I can't eat it's like yeah but what if this is really the one that matters <laughs> wait a minute wait wait you're missing the really good present now I have a couple of questions because we're 
coming into holiday season and I've heard you mention keto and peanuts and chocolate and almonds. What is it about the nuts that, I, that we have to be careful of? I think one of our go-to foods nowadays, when you look at all of the different types of energy bars and all of that contains a lot of that. Is that high in oxalate? Very, very high in oxalate. The nuts, seeds generally use oxalic acid crystals to, to store calcium. And um, so they're loaded with crystals and they, and oxalic acid too. And they also have lots of other toxins in them. They're designed to be indigestible. They, you know, there's arsenic and, and cyanide and just strange things you don't want to eat and oxalic acid and almonds and peanuts have very high, what we call bioavailability with the oxalate in them. That means a lot of it gets into your bloodstream. And when you start concentrating them into peanut butter and even there's still even some crystals in this material because it is, you know, like I said, it's in the crystal form. I've had people tell me they've worn down their teeth from biting on apples covered in almond butter. And they think it's now they're realizing it was probably the, the grit that you don't normally notice, but causes what we call dental microwear. So first place to start. If you're eating a lot of nuts, especially almonds, cashews, and peanuts, please quit doing that because that is mm, keto bread and keto treats. You can start really making yourself sick. Wow. Surprising because you think you're eating healthy. Now, a while ago, I, as I was researching things like veganism and all that, I noticed that a lot of things were made with cashews. So even if it's been processed, kinds of like the different butters or things like that, that they're making out of cashews. So even when it's highly processed, that's probably just as bad. Yeah, the, the sort of imitation cheeses and imitation cream and things like that with cashews, very popular new products out there. And again, this is new. People couldn't afford nuts at this level. They're now industrial produced, so they're more affordable and people have more money to spend. And so this is a new thing, not a good thing. The the kind of processing that lowers oxalate is not heat or pureeing or mechanical in nature. It is separation. So you can separate oxalates out of, say, potatoes. If you're using potato starch, that's almost no oxalate. Or if you're using curcumin extract instead of turmeric, which is another one I don't think I mentioned earlier, that's very low to no oxalate. So, But with cashews, just turning them into butter or to cheese or whatever, you're very high oxalate still. Wow, because now you got me going down another rabbit hole here, Sally. You said turmeric, and I'm thinking how that's really popular now, too. We could go on and on with this. So I'm so glad your book, Toxic Superfoods, is coming out, because each time we're I'm asking a question, I'm like, oh, my goodness, here's a whole nother rabbit hole, because a lot of people say turmeric's good for inflammation, but if it's high in oxalates, is it really good for inflammation? It's not, and the researchers agree with me. So let's, if you start reading the research and you'll get a chance, read the book and see the references and start digging around. There's, it'll keep you busy. There's at least 400 references in the books. <laughs> so you can dig around and see the actual opinions of leaders in the field who are saying, you know, the idea of these sort of antioxidants in superfoods like turmeric or whatever is, is a lot of wishful thinking on a part of researchers and they have to really pump it up in their reports in order to keep getting funding uh, to convince the funders, yeah, there's something good here. And they have managed to whip up an exciting storm and they've spent a lot of money really just to show very little true benefit from it. So uh, it, it's just like, uh, really, it's not as scary as it seems. It's just that somehow we have put these things on a pedestal unnecessarily without actually vetting them. It's like, we didn't do a security check on them before we hired them as our buddies. And it's time to do that. <laughs> and, so, and right now it's time to take a quick commercial break. So we'll use this as our time and we'll be right back with more of Sally Norton and understanding toxic superfoods and oxalates. So we'll be right back. Life Interrupted Radio will return after these messages from our sponsors. It's great sponsors like these that keep this show coming to you every week. Be sure and stop by lifeinterruptedradio.com to learn more. Your conscious lifestyle on steroids. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. If you're worried your friend may be struggling, remember, you don't have to be there to be there. 
You can say how are you or get a fake tattoo. You can ask with an app if it works for you. You could chat on the game, kick off your flip flops. You can ask on your couch while you binge watch. Whatever, whatever, whatever gets you talking. Reach out to a friend about their mental health. Learn how you can help at seizetheawkward.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, and the Jed Foundation. Ohm Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Listen and imagine. It takes five seconds to send a text, and for those five seconds, you're driving blind. Life is worth more than a text. Stay alive. Don't text and drive. Visit StopTextStopRex.org, a message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Project Yellow Light, Noise, and the Ad Council. Hi, this is Sharon, and of course you know me from here on the Autoimmune Hour. Maybe you don't know I'm also an author. My latest book is for kids. It's Pinky Chenille and the Rainbow Hunters, a winner of a five-star reader's favorite review. It's perfect for your early reader and a great bedtime story for your young adventurers. Check it out over at PinkyChenille.com. That's P-I-N-K-Y-C-H-E-N-I-L-L-E.com. See you there. Welcome back from that quick commercial break. We're here with Sally K. Norton, and she is the author of the forthcoming book called Toxic Superfoods. And we've been discussing oxalates as well as nutrition and nutritious foods and what to eat and been surprised at how many things that oxalates can really cause. And I'll say mask. I wanted to ask Sally about autoimmune disease and oxalates, because as I was going through the list on your website, some of the things that I was like, wow, could that be causing my autoimmune disease? So, or maybe at least contributing to it. So let's talk about autoimmune disease and not only oxalates, but nutrition. Well, one of the things that I think is most important to understand is our conception of lots of things are misconstrues in a lot of ways. And that goes with autoimmune disease itself. I'm surprised to see that the NIH website still says that the more than 80 diseases that are considered autoimmune in nature are a result of the immune system attacking the body's own organs, tissues, and cells. I've never quite agreed with that. I just, that does not make sense to me. The body does not do that. (laughs) To me, there's something else going on. (laughs) The NIH's own leaders have written papers about how wrong that is. And yet that's still what's out there on the website. So what we know from the science and and what researchers actually understand this will tell you is that there is a provocation going on that's really upsetting the immune system. All right. And so there's two key things to be thinking about. One of them is this what's called a response to danger. So the immune cells are like sentries, you know, hanging around in tissues, checking to see that everything's okay. And when things aren't okay, they snap into action. So to the immune cells, a danger signal is happening when the cells start being a little damaged and start spilling out potassium and other molecules. They're like, ooh, there shouldn't be potassium out here. Potassium is supposed to be inside the heart muscle cell, not on the outside. And when it's spilling out, that's the researchers call it a damp, the danger associated molecular patterns. These are, you know, changes in the molecules, in the tissue, in the fluids around the cells that the immune cells are like, ah, this is not right. Our cells are in trouble and they're going to defend against the problem. So they're going to whip up this chemical signal and they're going to say, hey, that's kind of like turning on the alarms at the firehouse come on guys, we got a problem over here. And it starts this war path and it creates this sort of cytokine storm, they call it. And that process of the immune cells going, we're going to save you. We're going to defend ourselves for the name of our own survival. The process adds additional damage to the body. Now, 
what is causing the cellular damage? There's an inciting stimulus, they call it. That's the word. There's an, it, that's what the researchers say. There's this inciting stimulus underneath all autoimmune conditions. Something is turning on this response over and over. This frequent engagement is being caused by something. And yeah, we act like we don't know what that could be, even though we see in the literature, the kinds of things that do that are things like oxalic acid and oxalate crystals, asbestos crystals, silica crystals. These particulates that can build up in the body are a great example. And they're actually considered to be the same. Like they'll say an oxalate crystal is the same as asbestos crystal or silica crystal. So asbestosis, which will get into your lungs from breathing, creates a you know, chronic immune activation in the lungs and you lose your ability to breathe and you need a lung transplant. Now with oxalates, you're not breathing in, although you can because polluted air has oxalic acid in it. It's one of the acids that makes rain acid is oxalic acid. You can breathe it, but the biggest way we're exposing ourselves to it is we're eating things like beets and nuts and potatoes and peanuts and chocolate routinely as normal staples. And we're exposing our, not only our gut is a big part of the immune system, by the way, and eating the little crystals and the acid is, are both quite damaging to the gut. The crystals will cause mechanical damage and the acid will float between the cells with the water and gets into the bloodstream. Well, guess who's in the bloodstream? Your immune cells. The circulating immune cells were shown after a one spinach smoothie, 40 minutes later, to be damaged with now they're putting out pro-inflammatory chemicals, their mitochondria are messed up. It turns up the whole system of unhappiness and changes your immune system from a nice little immune system to one that's pro-inflammatory and putting out that kind of chemical message. It's like, oh, let's cause trouble. You're damaging your circulating immune cells after every spinach smoothie or a slice of keto bread, et cetera. Big load of mashed potatoes and French fries are doing this. And then that acid, after it's damaged cells, and the, I could talk forever just about the various kinds of cell damage <laughs> and effects, but it's moving on from that blood that's surrounding your gut. You know, you're absorbing food. It goes into the circulation by your intestines and so on that goes straight to the liver. That's called hepatic circulation. So there's those cells in there, those, those vascular system goes straight to the liver. The liver has to kind of carefully decide what to do with everything that's in the blood. It doesn't have any way to do anything about the oxalic acid that you've absorbed. In fact, the liver makes more of it from vitamin C and, and the breakdown of amino acids. So the liver adds more oxalic acid to the bloodstream, goes straight to your heart, lungs, heart, and it goes through the body. So now you've got oxalic acid circulating anywhere where you have capillaries. <laughs> it can't get anywhere. But I read that it's not that easy to test for. Yeah, so... you can't test for oxalate very easily. They really can't. And they, so they've been researchers, when they do these studies, they rely on testing the urine. And what the urine tests seem to show is that the absorption of oxalic acid and it's showing up in the urine because the, the kidneys are the main way the body gets rid of it. There's a peak at about four hours where the amount of oxalate in the urine and blood is at its highest, but it stays elevated from ground zero where it would prefer to be for eight to 10 hours or more. And if you ate, you know, say peanut butter and toast for breakfast, and then maybe a hot chocolate with lunch or a spinach salad, that's only four hours apart. So right at that peak, you're adding another meal with more oxalate. So you can be continuously building up your oxalate amount in your system all day long. And that's what I used to do. I used to end the day with sweet potatoes. Sometimes I would start the day and end the day with sweet potatoes. And at night, you know, that's when you could have your highest level at bedtime. So if you suddenly, like I was having attacks of hiccups and belching right at bedtime, I'd lay down and all of a sudden my system would just go spastic. Well, that's electrolyte imbalances causing neurotoxicity and muscle spasms that re result in things like hiccups and reflux. And you can end up with things at the other end too, it might be constipation or diarrhea or fecal incontinence. So at bedtime, you're at your worst. So this, you've got not only this acute exposure of the acid after meals, but then you have too much in your system and it ends up having to collect in your body. So it accumulates, including in your bones and bone marrow, but your cells are born in the bone marrow. 
with oxalic acid and oxalate crystals there too. So you can actually bore brand new, somewhat not quite right, a little too immature cells, both red and white, too early from bone marrow that's collecting oxalate. So you get immune damage both at the birth and at the, what you might say, high school age immune cells that are hanging out in the bloodstream waiting for their career to show up. But before they even get to their careers, they're already messed up from oxalate. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I'm a, needing a little clarification because some of the things I'm hearing, I've also been hearing recently about histamine overload or histamine responses. Is Are those two things different? <laughs> I'm a, I mean, what I'm hearing sounds a lot like what I've been told about something called mast cell activation syndrome and histamine as well. Yes. Yeah, so what could be an inciting stimulus for mast cells to get unhappy and start flipping out and having these hissy fits where they melt down and spew histamine everywhere? What could be that inciting stimulus? So it turns out with oxalate poisoning, you end up creating either mast cell activation syndrome, chronic like allergies to everything, where you become intolerant to every food in the kingdom and everything else, or even develop a kind of immune activation with the crystals in the breast where you end up developing breast cancer and these kinds of problems. Uh, you end up developing vascular decay. I and mean, the list is quite long. And immune activation is a big piece of the picture. Immune cells are sensitive to toxins. Nerves and immune cells do not like toxins. And oxalate is this ubiquitous thing that we're eating a lot of now with modern eating, with the popularity of potatoes and peanuts and chocolate alone, and peanut butter and toast with whole wheat bread. And, you know, they're just ubiquitous now. Okay. So I see where I'm thinking about the histamine response. I was putting them on the same level, but you're saying the oxalates are the agitator that cause the histamine response or can play a part in causing the histamine response. Right. Because mast cells react to lots of stuff. <laughs> they're like, <laughs> yeah. you know, you think a bad thought and they're like on the go for you because they're really on your side. They're like listening for problems and you keep showing up with these irritants and it's like, okay, we won't anything bother you, honey. And they're off to the races and you can get really sick on this excessive enthusiasm from your poor little mast cells. So even, you know, I remind people we need to calm our nervous system, calm our minds, and really, you know, work on our mindset too, because you don't want to keep training your mast cells to be hysterical all the time. But if they're poisoned, they can't help themselves because they're a little bit damaged. They're literally damaged. They don't have the right oomph. In fact, you know, what the research suggests is that this is why you get chronic infections like sinus infections and yeast infections and UTIs and all this stuff, because your immune cells have been damaged by oxalate and they're no longer good at fighting bacterial infection and those kinds of problems. Is oxalate the only thing that is agitating all this? I mean, in my mind, I'm thinking there's so many things we're exposed to. Yes. <laughs> will will right. just eliminating certain foods like beet greens and spinach and potatoes solve this? Isn't that hysteria a, that our that cells sound are like through? a ridiculous idea? <laughs> well, no, it doesn't sound ridiculous other than I'm thinking of all of the things we're exposed to, including now freaking out about microplastics. It's <laughs> just, you know, and EMFs and all of that. Yes. And so, you know, those of us like I figured out at age 40 that I had multiple chemical sensitivity and I couldn't handle rayon tampons and dioxins and I buy special toilet paper and do all these things because I'm so sensitive to everything, you know, like everything that I did to live a good lifestyle that's free of all that stuff, grow my own organic food and be really particular about my water and everything. None of it works. The only thing that worked was getting off the sweet potatoes and the chard and the stuff that I was eating, thinking they were okay. And that is a freaking shocker. This is why you kind of go into a certain amount of emotional, like deer in the headlights, like how this, this, no, wait, isn't all these, isn't it glyphosate's fault? Isn't it plastic's fault? Isn't it the shoe polish? You know, like it can't be, it can't be the chart. <laughs> but in fact, the science is there to explain why we get these miraculous recoveries. I went from somebody who could not work. I was on the couch, unable to exercise, read the mail, do anything to someone who pulled off writing a book. Like that's a big shift. That's huge. 
we get our lives back with the the recoveries that we have we're going to start seeing more of these people coming forward with their recovery stories from amazing difficulties multiple surgeries all kinds of fibrotic disorders all kinds of neurological problems with anxiety and supposed auto i thought i had dozens of autoimmune problems and you know it so much of it shifted and went away the problem the key problem is that inciting stimulus that carries on forward are this little bits of invisible crystals that are building up in our bone marrow, our tissues, our joints, our glands, our tendons. And that is a big deal. Um, now you're loaded with the problem. Yeah. So we're walking around with this, these little piles of um, poison. So we have are going through our recovery. We're off these foods we're feeling better. And yet you're saying there's sort of a land, there are landmines that are still waiting. What do we do to clear out all of that overload that's been building up for decades? Well, mostly we have to trust the body to do it on its own schedule. But if you go really abruptly from a diet that's high in oxalate with spinach smoothies or keto bread, or, you know, some of these really high oxalate bombs that are popular right now, and you suddenly just cut everything out and try to like some people go from plant-based to carnivore. Carnivore is basically a zero oxalate diet. Some people seem to get away with that for a while. And at some point, it might only be a week or it might be three years. At some point, suddenly you are not feeling well. And that is probably the immune system having to go dig out this mess in your tissues. Uh, and there are ways to support yourself in that. But one way is to just take your time making the transition. So I, I liken this to having a sleeping babies in a bedroom and they seem to fall asleep. And if they know you leave, they'll start crying again. So you just sort of sneak out backwards, tiptoe, carefully shut the door. <laughs> That's what you're doing with your immune system and these crystals. Like, okay, let's pretend you're not going to notice that I'm leaving. You're not going to notice we're changing. So if you, because the body's hearing signals, it's reading your diet. It's reading your high oxalate diet, which is sort of a late summer, early fall harvest diet full of raspberries and beets and sweet potatoes. And then if you go straight to the winter diet, which the carnivore zero oxalate diet, the body's like, huh, this is my time. This is my time to get rid of it. The body knows about oxalate. It knows how to sequester it and hold on to it, hopefully for the summer and then get rid of it in the winter. And, but now if you're over the age of five, you're, you've got years of winters to make up for. And so we want to do it slowly. So we support the body with a, trying to go slowly, B, getting enough citric acid to help you protect your kidneys and, and replacing minerals, calcium, potassium, magnesium are really important because you're deficient in them because of your high oxalate diet and you continue to lose them in the process of escorting this gunk out of your system. You could create a kidney stone on a low oxalate diet because you're releasing the oxalic acid crystals maybe from your bone marrow and putting it back into the circulation system and the kidneys have to do this work. And so if you go too fast, it causes vascular inflammation. It can promote that mast cell activation problem. It can promote the food allergies and the side effects of an immune system that's overworked. So you don't want to overwork your immune system. You want to kind of like actually keep a little bit of oxalates around. <laughs> so like you can have one leaf of spinach, just don't do a whole smoothie. Uh, you can have three olives, just don't do 25 of them. You know, it's, some of it's like, well, yeah, maybe you should keep tea as an example of a high oxalate food that's not horribly high. And if you keep tea in your diet, it might help oh, you. Oh, don't take my tea. You can have it for a while. <laughs> Uh, and use it as a way to tell your body, hey, it isn't winter. It's not winter. You can't go too hard and heavy on cleaning up my mess. Oh, wow. Okay. Now I just hurt my feelings there about the tea. Um, I know. <laughs> where can we, we're just about out of time. We only have about five okay. minutes left. Where can we find out? I mean, the list just got longer for me when you added tea there. My, my ears perked up. Is there a list that we can go and find? Like these are the high oxalate foods and maybe the medium oxalate foods and the low oxalate foods? Well, it, it's not about the food itself being medium. It's about the portion. Oh, so those lists that go high, medium, low are a little risky because, oh, medium, I can have it. No, wait a minute. It's how much are you eating? And, and of course, the data is a little tricky because 
plants vary a lot. So even though we've measured spinach 15 times, this still the spinach you're buying may be a little different than that. So rounding the numbers and using, you know, like ballpark things. So really just using a list of high oxalate foods, low oxalate foods, which I provide on my website in the beginner's guide. And if you sign up for the listserv, you'll get that for free, or you can pay a couple dollars for it. You can get it in print if you need it. And you're just working with the high and low and just like figuring out your own situation. You know, what is it, which are your go-to high oxalate foods and which ones can you live without and start finding replacements for and other things to eat. The other thing is to remember that vitamin C turns into oxalate. So if you're mega dosing vitamin C and routinely you're buying a lot of fortified foods, a lot of drinks have vitamin C fortified in it. You need to cut back on that to, you know, under 250 milligrams a day, because that is promoting an oxalate problem. And it doesn't, change your diet much and it doesn't hurt your health. It, your immune cells can only soak up so much vitamin C and the excess hanging around is can turn into oxalate. But just to keep it simple, don't try to become like a mathematician. Just become, get that filter in your head. Hey, which foods are high oxalate foods? Which foods are low oxalate foods? You just start to learn that filter and be patient with the process and have faith. I do have a PDF cookbook available on my website that teaches you what to do with a turnip and a rutabaga and cabbage and apples and things that are pretty modest to low and oxalate where you can have full portions. And, but, and some things just because they're high, doesn't mean you have, you don't need to eat zero, but you need to be like, really, if you're going to eat chocolate, you're going to do like one chocolate chip cookie and be done. Not, not a whole pile of fudge brownies, that kind of thing. But some people, if you're really sick, and if you're truly got health problems, you're going to need to be a little bit more careful about listening to your body, about whether you tolerate these foods at, at all. Well, a quick question. This is fabulous. This is fantastic. I'm also going, okay, this sounds like something I'd love to do. Are there specific things I should ask my medical professionals to find out if they're on board with this? Because it sounds like there's still some lack of understanding of oxalates and this really is completely new from a clinical perspective it's there in the medical literature from a deep research side but it has not been translated into cr clinical practice and probably won't be soon because unfortunately we've we've shifted our attention to clinical practices where you have easy diagnostics and easy remedies where you can write a prescription this is neither of those the prescription is teaching people to notice what high oxalate foods are eating and how to shift away from them that is not what doctors go to school for. So even if even if we could get correct the protocols, like you've had a kidney stone, the low oxalate diet is very much part of not getting another one. But that's not even in the protocols now, which is really shameful. But the guys who write the protocols have investments in diagnostic companies and other things. And they really have been trying to get away from the diet stuff, even though it's there are researchers that keep fighting, yes, the low oxalate diet still matters for kidney health. <laughs> and it turns out that oxalate is a major cause of chronic kidney disease. But it, in clinical practice, it just doesn't work that way anymore in a profit-centered system. It's just not a good fit. So you can ask your doctor to test your standard blood protocol and you get a sense of your GFR and your BUN. You can see how your white cells are doing. You can see how your thyroid is doing. You can get a bone density scan and see if oxalates have caused either a mixed pattern of osteopenia in one place and normal or high in another, that's probably a sign of a deposition problem. Or if you just osteopenia or osteoporosis, this is like oxalate is the worst thing you could eat. So those are the simple tests is just keep a track of your basics, including your GFR and your uh, thyroid and maybe get a bone density scan. Is it, it, I, it's nice to see that change. Like I went from deep osteopenia on the edge of becoming osteoporotic to normal in a few years, just doing the diet. Wow. Fantastic. Wish we could uh, spend more time because this is just the tip of the iceberg as far as my understanding of it, as well as I just find that when I changed my diet and I'm going to continue to change it now that I know more about these toxic superfoods, I know that so many things changed in my wellness and began to optimize my health as well. So everyone, that's Sally K. Norton. Her website is sallyknorton.com. You can go over there and pre-order her book called Toxic Superfoods. What final parting thoughts do you have for us, Sally? Well, I invite everyone to keep learning. This is so, so empowering, really is. It sounds a little scary on the surface, but it is really empowering and exciting 
come join the community of people who are getting better on this. You will find a lot of loving spirits reaching out. A lot of us are hanging out on Instagram, but please keep learning. And, and hopefully you'll find this book really instructive and, and give you a better position to share it with others. If you're concerned about your daughter, neighbor, friends, whatever, this is a great opportunity to give them a fairly simple way out of what can sometimes be a horrendous situation. Uh, absolutely, I agree. Diet is key, uh, too often overlooked. Her forthcoming book is called Toxic Superfoods. It releases on December 27th, sallyknorton.com. You can find her there. And where do we find you on Instagram? I have two accounts. One is SK Norton, and then there's another newer one, Toxic Superfoods underscore oxalate underscore book. So check me out both places and then come meet the gals and guys who are like, woohoo, getting their lives back. It's pretty fun. And uh, it, it just helps you get a sense for how this all works. So, yeah. Fantastic. And everyone, thank you for being here. That's such an important topic. And I just, one of the things I want to stress is how nutrition and understanding nutrition, and I continue to understand it more and more, it actually saved my life and how important it is that we understand our foods. Our foods have gotten so complex these days and all the information has gotten complex and just breaking it down into simple ways to deal with it as Sally has done for us today. So everyone have a great week, whatever your adventures. Join me next week for another brand new episode. Enjoy. The information provided on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune and Life Interrupted Radio, including the websites understandingautoimmune.com and lifeinterruptedradio.com, plus social media, is for educational purposes only. What you read, hear, and see on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune and Life Interrupted Radio, and its websites and other media outlets is based on experience only. The information should never be used for any legal, diagnostic, or treatment purposes. 